You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Radio Public, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for September 6, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance Headquarters, where we have sharpied ourselves a new congressional district. You're welcome, Betsy Dirksen Londergren. It's the professional left with Drip Glass and Blue Gal. Let's just sharpie everything. I think that's just the way you do it. Now, I have a question. <laughs> it's a Zen question. Uh, did did President Stupid Sharpie the map, or is the Sharpie using him to Sharpie us, Blue Gal? Yeah, okay. Yeah, see? I think he got Sharpied. I think he he definitely got Sharpied this week. Yeah. I think he this likes is... to sniff the fumes. I know I used to when I used to... <laughs> well, I used to do I used to do computer training at uh, New Horizons in Chicago for about you know, a minute. And man, those Expo pens were the source of glory and cheap high during the lunch breaks. Um, wow. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's just, you know, high on huffing that shop with that Sharpie juice. Mm-hmm. Well, he, he signs bills with a Sharpie, too. So yeah. it's it is a Sharpie thing with him. Yeah. And I also think that this Sharpie story, which continues to have oxygen because the president of the United States right. continues to insist on talking about it. Right. Is uh, very much like the time when George H.W. Bush expressed an exclamation about the grocery store line and the scanning of the groceries, Mm -hmm. which is uh, a presidential candidate uh, doing something that everyone can understand what he did and how he reacted and the thing that he was talking about. Everyone understands a hurricane, how it moves, whether or not it hits you. (laughs) Well, everyone, but... Everyone with Bill O'Reilly, who doesn't understand tides, still doesn't well, understand you know, tides. So, yeah. But other than that, everyone understands everyone how Everyone understands work. looking at a weather map and being told by the National Weather Service whether a hurricane is going to hit you or not. That is not complicated. Right. And the fact that the so-called president decided to riff on mm-hmm. the national weather map and mention Alabama, which to my mind was clearly... Uh, you know, he's thinking about the Senate race, trying to give his solid core state support and say a name of a state that is going to vote for him made him feel good. <laughs> so right. he said right. Alabama. And here, here is this map that is three days old that says it might go to Alabama. And he, mm-hmm. he has been updated since that time. But he continues to say it because saying Alabama makes him feel good. But everyone in Alabama knew that the storm wasn't going to hit them. And for him to continue to insist that what he said three days ago in a fluid situation when a storm will change trajectory, uh, people understand that he messed up and he is insisting that he's right. And that's crazy. Would you like to hear an alternate theory? Okay. And then we'll and then we'll wrap this up in a nice bow. <laughs> I don't remember where I heard this, but as you know, uh, President Stupid is illiterate. He cannot read. Well, he's blind. He is, yes. Yeah. He's blind and he's illiterate. He knows nine words like never before. This is the fourth Category 5 hurricane mm-hmm. that's hit while he was in office. Right. Uh, but every time... This thing happens. I've never heard of such a thing. I never even knew there was a Category 5. This is a never before. Biggest, wettest, most incredible storm ever. And everyone knows that he he just has no functioning higher, you know, higher mental ability. He just doesn't understand shit. And he's probably nearly illiterate. And he's certainly blind. So I heard a theory advance that he was reading the Bahamas and got it confused with Alabama. Oh, wow. And kept insisting... No, it's going to hit Alabama. I saw it. I know I saw it. It's there. And, of course, uh, I I mentioned before uh, you and I were having dinner the other night Mm -hmm. because we do that. Um, Talking about the the Siberian Railroad. Mm Mm-hmm. And there's an it's an apocryphal story, but it fits so very well. Yes, it does. Is, yes, it does. 
um, the, the, the czar uh, had, had issued a decree to have a railroad built from across Russia. And there was a section of it that he was looking over and the engineers had very carefully drawn around the swamps and through the mountains and, you know, bypassed various things and over rivers. And this did not suit him because he wanted a fucking straight line. So he took a straight edge and just drew a straight line right across the map, said, do that, and walked away. And of course, if you tell the czar that you can't do it, or it's insane, or it it violates every good engineering principle, and it, it'll cost a zillion times more, the czar will shoot you. Mm-hmm. So you don't do that. You never contradict the czar. There was a problem, though, that the straight edge that he was holding down, his thumb bumped out just a little bit over the edge of it. So he actually drew a little loop on the straight line. And if you look on the railroad today, there's a little loop yep. <laughs> on that straight railroad that no one knows why it's there. And it's the czar's it is, thumb. That's what it the is. The czar's thumb. Yeah. Because you, again, it's an apocryphal story. It's not, not tr- technically true, but it's too good not to repeat. But it is this idea that when you have, when you work for a dictator, you cannot tell them they're wrong ever, no. ever. No. Because they will take you out and shoot you or they make you unemployable or they'll tweet mean things about you. So uh, if if President Stupid draws a Sharpie shit on a map and says it was Alabama, then fuck it. That's what really happened. And crowd sizes, it was the biggest crowd ever, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and that's, but that's a- the fun game on Twitter. People are drawing a wall between Mexico and the United States. And you could have a wall over the Rio Grande right in the water if you draw it in a Sharpie, yeah. right? Now, now the question that my secondary question is, yes. My secondary question is, why doesn't this, I mean, the, the Alabama is full of Trump Republicans, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And this is a big story. This has dominated the news for like three days right. now, and he just won't shut the fuck up about it. So why aren't his base embarrassed? And I, I, my theory about that is this is GOP 101. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you've ever argued with a conservative, you will notice a certain pattern. They stake out an obviously insane position. Uh, or they get real mad because Barack Obama put his uh, feet up on the on the uh, on the desk in the White House. Because no one has ever done that before. And they will hunker down and refuse to believe anything that contradicts them. They will make themselves flaming assholes on the topic. They will they will grind away at it for years if necessary. They will never shut up about it. And then once everyone finally gets tired of arguing with what's obviously a lunatic, they declare victory. And then he's still standing as so-called president of the United States. So he wins. Exactly what he told did you. With, with I told you. No collusion, no collusion, no collusion. Right. Just no one wants to talk it. to him anymore have... about it, right? So he wins. Mm-hmm. Right. There's this moment when you analyze what Donald Trump does. When you realize, and there's the, the second sentence. The second sentence is always, and of course, he will not be held accountable for any of this. And of course, his base won't change their mind. That's the story. That is the story. Yeah. That's the real story. The story, the, the most important political story of our lifetime, I would, I would argue, is that a third of this country is brainwashed and willingly so. And that is such a terrifying thought that the media simply won't talk about it. They'll talk about Donald Trump as if he were uh, just a, an orbiting object that has no attachment to any political party or belief system or anything. When all you have to do is stick your head out the window. To see that, no, no, he's reflecting about a third of this country yep. who are who have been steadily lobotomized by Fox News and hate radio for 30 years and who do it to themselves. And, and to the point that they believe that this very sick person is the Messiah. Is a genius yeah. and the Messiah. Yeah. Because he makes liberals cry. Well, yes, he sets fire to the Constitution and he lies about shit and people die over it. But he moved and yes, the, the embassy in Israel. So he's obviously moving us all toward the Armageddon for a good. And mm-hmm. that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Which so, is why which is why Eric Erickson doesn't care about climate change. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to that's talk another. about that because this is do. this is uh, anti uh, the Pope. Right. <laughs> this is anti uh, stewardship of the planet. Mm-hmm. And he's doing it as a branding exercise. Yes, he, he uh, knows. Go ahead who and pays go ahead bill. and tell him what Eric Erickson. Oh, said. Uh, Eric Erickson just went on Twitter to declare that he does not believe, does not, uh, does not care about climate change. Doesn't care about it. What he cares about are us libtards, uh, Democrats trying to drag us back to the dark ages with our wind and our solar. Mm-hmm. That's what he cares about. 
And there's so much stupid bundled up in that. But the reason anyone noticed or cared is that Eric Erickson has a big, loud media voice. Mm -hmm. Eric Erickson was a CNN contributor. Eric Erickson is the guy who organized the CPAC. This is not a, a minority position on the right. This is how they think. And it is terrifying that they have finally just given up pretending and straddling and saying, well, the science, well, you know, well, whatever. They're just saying, nah, eh, I don't care if it kills us all. All I care about is that I live in comfort and that liberals cry over it. But I, but I think it goes deeper than that. I think mm -hmm. Eric Erickson lives in a world where his livelihood depends on gathering up that 30% of the American public to uh, read his blog and mm -hmm. support him on CNN or wherever he is. Right. And his competition is Dinesh D'Souza. Yes. So you have to go full denial of reality in a really aggressive, hostile way in order to rise above the noise. Talk to me about, um, there's an elected uh, senator, elected to, and this is more important to talk about elected yes. officials. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one named Mitch McConnell. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Mitch McConnell uh, made the news in two different ways this week. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I'd like to announce to everyone that we at the professional left are 100% there for Moscow Mitch crying to Hugh Hewitt about the unfairness of his richly deserved nickname. It's not I fair. You know, it was, it's not yeah, fair. It's Moscow Mitch. It's over the top. It's over the top because uh, I don't know why, because it's 100 percent accurate. But really, I just it's uncalled for. So, you know, Mitch McConnell is a, is the uh, leader of the Senate. He is the second most powerful person in the Republican Party, arguably. Um, and he is absolutely paid off by Russia and by foreign powers. And he is absolutely as corrupt as any person who's ever walked the earth. And he doesn't go talk to Fox News very often. No, he, doesn't he doesn't talk to CNN or MSNBC ever. But he went to Hugh Hewitt. He was on Hugh, Hugh Hewitt. Hewitt's radio show. Again, audience is important. Mm -hmm. Who is Hugh Hewitt's audience? Yeah. Right Those wing Those lawyers people. and judges and real estate agents who are going to support the Republican Senate campaign committee with big checks. And, and why is Hugh Hewitt not an obscure third tier crackpot like Dinesh D'Souza because within a month guarantee you hand to heart he will be on meet the press yeah and he he, is, he gets he's Mitch McConnell on his show he gets <clears throat> Mitch McConnell on his show because he has that golden rolodex of republicans mm -hmm. and he will not an ask them one hard question and Mitch McConnell the second thing he did this week that was I thought was wonderful uh wanted to make very clear this week is he reiterated that he is powerless to bring any legislation to the floor of the senate without the express approval of the dear leader that was remarkable uh, that was, was absolutely remarkable. If you yeah. don't think that the Republican Party has completely devolved into a Donald Trump cult, that mm -hmm. is exhibit A, that, yeah. that here is Mitch McConnell saying, I will not bring anything to the Senate floor on guns that Donald Trump doesn't approve ahead of time and say he will sign. Right. That's it. Anything. Yep. And, and that is also, I think, a diss to Donald Trump, too, that I'm not going to spend any political capital on no. anti-NRA legislation unless the president takes the hit, the so-called well, president takes the hit. And he, I, Mitch McConnell is assuming that, I think, even though he is not long for this world, that he will be around longer than Donald Trump. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that yeah. He will outlast. His, his influence will outlast Donald Trump. Well, and, and I was going to say, if... if uh, we're going to talk to Mitch McConnell about what's fair, Moscow Mitch, about what's fair and what isn't. Let's uh, yeah. write the words America Garland on a hammer yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. use it well, and over that, and over that is, again. That, that, is, that brings us back to one of our sort of uh, evergreen topics, which is there is no more media. Mm -hmm. There are no people uh, hounding Mitch McConnell for an answer to these questions. There just aren't. There are no people staking out his house. There's no people uh, harassing him in restaurants other than good liberals. There's nobody demanding an answer to what the fuck, how the hell do you say things like this and sleep at night? Right. How do you do that? They just aren't because they've given up. There's no answer. The only people, this is something I was delighted and depressed to see um, this being reflected, I believe on the Chris Hayes show and, and, and several other shows where, where smart people are getting together to talk about things that the only party 
talking about anything of substance is the Democratic right. Party. There is right. only one sane political party left. And that's what makes it so confusing because you have this vast spectrum of opinion inside the Democratic Party, which in a healthy country would be at least two parties. Yeah. Yeah. But we only have a, a system where two parties can exist and one party is completely owned by Fox News, Rupert Murdoch, Donald Trump, and Hate Radio. And there's no room in that party for anyone who has any respect for history or science or causality or chemistry or anything. Uh, their own their own belief system five minutes ago, which they will reverse at the drop of a hat. So but Drift Class, every Drift Class, I have yep. hope. I have hope you for do. the media all of a sudden. Well, good for you. Because, because I see presidential candidates on our side yes. training the media about oh, yeah. well, their questions and how yes. the, the questions that they are asking from a Republican frame of mind, which, yes. let's face it, Rush Limbaugh and Newt Gingrich have trained the media to think right. about climate change as government overreach and right. taxes as theft and I mean, I can go on and on, but this week, CNN held a climate change forum, which went on for seven hours. And yes, they did. you know, very few people watched it. There are a couple of clips that I would recommend you go and check out at Crooks and Liars. One is Pete Buttigieg saying that, you know, Donald Trump lives in a different reality from the rest of us. And he didn't have to say, and his voters do too. Uh, and the other one was Elizabeth Warren when uh, Chris Cuomo framed the question, should the government be telling Americans what light bulbs to buy? Right. That's the way he framed the question. Mm -hmm. And she wouldn't accept it. Give right. me a break, she said. Yes, that's the you right know, Never mind that these Absolutely. light bulbs last longer and, and are cheaper to use and save you energy and are just a better product. Yeah. All the way around. Uh, all the way around. Government over, government's telling you what kind of light bulbs to buy. Government's telling you what kind of straws to buy. Government's telling you you can't have cheeseburgers anymore. That's the way that fossil fuel companies want you to be fighting with one another. This is what right. this was Warren's really good answer. You know, the, yeah. she the fossil fuel companies want us fighting over cheeseburgers and straws and light bulbs. Right. And, and losing. And losing. And because losing. Because those are right. Because those because we frame any reasonable discussion about climate change and American domestic policy and energy use and, and income inequality as insane liberals versus the reasonable people. Right. Right. And you're not going to take away my giant truck or my light bulbs or anything. Right. <laughs> and there are three industries that are creating most of the carbon uh, and the Koch brothers belong to one of them at least. Yeah. And so here we are with the CNN anchor at trying to hold a climate change forum and who is being taught is the moderator. Yes. You don't get to frame the question as government overreach. This is our, our planet we're talking about. Right. And it, and it is an economic question and it is a corruption question. And she put, she, you know, being the professor that she is in two and a half minutes explains to uh -huh. you in a way that everyone can understand that we are being manipulated into believing that this is not about corporate corruption, buying our elections and our politicians in order to keep polluting the planet. That's what it's right. about. And uh, I, so I have hope for the media that the media with the right politicians pushing back and saying no you don't get to answer the you don't get to ask and frame the question that way that mm -hmm. will get there i agree i agree to this extent the reason that the media has is broken is because they were punched in the face so many times by the right mm -hmm. who were well organized and well funded right. they were terrorized into never pushing back against the people who will beat the shit out of them and take their lunch right, money right right there's no one left for them to argue with but the left. They know that if they go, if they stand their ground and jut out their chin and demand accountability from the right, they will be bulldozed. Mm -hmm. They will absolutely be bulldozed into a professional early grave. There's no, there's no percentage in, in sitting in front of a camera and telling what might be a third of your audience that you are brainwashed idiots who vote for monsters and this is all your fucking fault. Because that's really what you're telling yep. them. 
And you won't so, sell dick pills that way. And the right. for-profit cable media companies know that. And, so, yeah. the, so at the media corporation that you work at, the advertising people are telling you to shut up, quit offending people who buy our stuff. And your and your news balance department, you know, the the people who run the op ed page of the New York Times are telling you, uh, don't offend people. Uh, remember, everything must be exactly split down the middle so that so that Nazis don't come to my house and throw eggs at my window, because that's what I'm afraid of. That's really what I'm afraid. Of. I'm afraid that the right will just te- will terrorize me, will dr- run me out of my neighborhood, and the left would never do that. So I'm safe. Um, picking on them. So every time there's a right-wing atrocity, we need to blame both sides. And this is what David Brooks has been doing for 15 mm-hmm. years. And for his crimes, he has been promoted and promoted and promoted and given a shit ton of money. So there's no mystery as to how this all works. So it is the only way to deal with this is to provide a sufficient amount of pushback to bad journalism and incompetent, weak journalism. And it's I, I agree it's starting to happen. I'm still pissed off when I see Chris Hayes or Soledad O'Brien, who both of whom I think do great work, asking rhetorical questions on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I wonder why yes, this is happening. Right. I wonder why Chris Cuomo can't ask a fucking straight question. Well, you know the answer to that question. But one day Chris Cuomo might be holding your resume in his hand. So you can't just say – Chris Cuomo does a shitty job of being a journalist, and he's one of the reasons why journalism is broken. And he does that because Instead, his job description says he has to do this this right. way, and he'll be fired if he doesn't. Yes. So you have to then ask, why does Jeff Zucker hire clowns like Chris Cuomo? Oh, that's really dangerous. Yeah, well. Because suddenly because you're, asking you're asking questions about, about the- Wall Street ownership of major corporations right. that run our media. So- and, and somewhere below that tier of ownership are the people who make hiring decisions and promotion decisions. And once you start talking about them by their name, mm-hmm. you can kiss ever working for any of those people goodbye ever again. And that's a really small pool of people. That's a very small universe, and it's getting smaller every day. So, let, let's, so also, is, let's pat them on the back when they do the right thing, which is have a climate exactly. change forum. And now they're going to have exactly. an LGBTQ forum. Uh, and let's pat and our the, candidates on the back for for being for finally, finally yeah. doing what Barack Obama never yep. did in, in his yep. in, when he was running for president either time, which is stop asking these stupid questions. Yeah, yeah. Your questions are framed in a, in a completely dishonest way, and you goddamn well know it. Um, and and, you, he was and a professor you, too. you can do it in a way that is folksy, as as right. both Warren and Sanders have done. Give me a break. Not, not sweary like me. Swear you don't like have you. to swear. Mm-hmm. And and again, I applaud CNN for having a cl- climate change forum. They were bullied by the left into doing that, by the way. And they, right. were, they were bullied by the left into having an LGBTQ forum. So mm-hmm. I don't have, uh, I, I don't underestimate our power to make no. things better. No. Uh, we have the power to make things better, and that's why we're here. So let's get on that and keep doing it. Um, but yeah, the the hope that I have is really that finally, as you say, we have candidates who are framing things the right way. So yeah. you mentioned a person, David Brooks, who has been yeah. trending on Twitter all day today. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm I'm getting a lot of notes from people. <laughs> <laughs> saying, by the way, question, did you read this thing dude, by David Brooks? Dude, yeah, I, gentlemen, ladies, I've been taking batting practice for 14 years. <laughs> I'm still not in the fucking majors. I'm still in the minors. I'm still in you know single A ball real out here low in the cornfield one and slow one it over was. the plate. <laughs> it was. And and I am I am slowly working my way into a post that will be read by literally dozens of people. <laughs> um, that will change nothing. But it it for me p- part of what we do and part of what part of what, the reason I write is to work things out on paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, you and I are doing a massive jigsaw puzzle on our table oh my right goodness. now, which has been invaded by cats and other other creatures and so forth, and having a marvelous time doing it. But this, writing and podcasting, for I think for both of us, is 50% the act of communicating with our fellow liberals and anyone else who wants to listen and sharing what we know and, and having a, a real community built around what we think and what we do and how we write and our shared values. And part of it is working things out 
it, just trying to figure out how does this work? What's going on here? And rearranging things on a page literally sometimes. So it's like, oh, oh, that's why A led to B led to C led to D. I couldn't see it for all the tall grass. But now I understand that's why this happens. So yeah, David Brooks absolutely lost his shit in the New York Times um, today. And for you historical buffs, you'll have to go back to aught five. Yeah. <laughs> to November of 2005, uh, when David Brooks in the New York Times wrote the Harry DeReed Code, which was a long, rambling tantrum, a hysterical tantrum, uh, which began, Harry Reid sits alone in his kitchen at 4 a.m. writing important notes in crayon on the outside of envelopes. And it was all about how Harry Reid is an idiot and an asshole and a liar and a fraud, and he believes in a cabal bent on destroying the world, and how Iraq was just uh, made up, and how uh, the fluoridation causes problems. And it was David Brooks just, just trying to be network. Ah. Except he's an idiot. He was trying to do I'm mad as hell, but I and I can't take it anymore. I'm mad, yeah. I'm mad at Harry Reid. Harry Reid sits alone in his kitchen at 4 a.m. writing important notes. And and it, it, it was just horrifying. And of course he got away with it. Every every week, David Brooks publishes in the New York Times something that is absolutely atrocious. Not usually hysterical, but it's myopic or stupid or it's just a lie. And the Schultzberger family doesn't care. The editorial staff of the New York Times but doesn't today, care. They just let him do why it. Why is he trending for hours and hours then? I will okay. tell you. Um, because he wrote an article entitled, and now a word from a fanatic. He's trying to ape notes from the underground. Oh. I'm a sick man. I'm a spiteful man. I'm an unattractive man. I believe my liver is diseased. <laughs> and it's all about, yeah, that's how, that's how he opens. He's, that's his opening salvo. And then he goes on to talk about, I'm one of those fanatics on the alt-right and the alt-left. The ones who make online forums so vicious, the ones who cancel and call out the minority of online posters who are filled with hatred, and so forth. And it's just this rambling, deranged, lashing out at everybody. It, owning the libs and smashing the racist right are the twin pillars of the crazy left and the crazy right. Everything is race. It sounds like somebody got really shaken by Brett Bug. That is exactly what happened. <laughs> that is exactly what happened. You see, the Beltway media is arranged around a certain set of rules. And most important rules in the Beltway media is that, that conservative pundit aristocrats like Ross Duthat and David Brooks and Michael Gerson and Brett Stevens, etc. It's a long, long list. Are never supposed to be criticized, mm -hmm. and the entire Beltway media is arranged so that these people never come in contact with their critics. The worst thing that ever happened to Brett Stevens in 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 his universe is, I think that Joe Scarborough might have cocked his eyebrow quizzically at him once. <laughs> and the worst thing that has ever happened to David Brooks in a critical in a setting in a media setting is that I believe one time. Mark Shields shook his jowls at him dismissively. Uh huh. Uh, even though they are, they're dear friends, and he'll always say my my good my good dear friend David Brooks, uh, and who who they're co they're co winners of a civility award. For yeah. A few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So they live in a world where it is it is forbidden to to criticize David Brooks and Brett Stevens, and being a trifling, weak, myopic dope. Um, David Brooks lives on unearned wealth and unearned privilege every day. And the only way he keeps his wealth and privilege intact is by living inside this closed ecosystem where criticism of the aristocracy of the right, which is they consider themselves to be, they really do consider themselves to be above everyone else, mm -hmm. is the law. And last week, Brett Stevens shot himself, <clears throat> as I said last week, in the, in the foot with a BB gun. And then he shot himself in the same foot with a shotgun yeah. and then he grabbed a bazooka <laughs> and said, and then when, but the problem with, with Brett Steve, the problem he faced was the peasants kept punching back mm -hmm. and they kept punching back harder and harder. And because his, his basic premise was insane. He went out of his way to find some trivial slight uh, on the internet where he was, he was called something that he didn't think was fair. 
Then he blew it up into an attack on the guy who wrote it, plus the guy's boss. Then he blew it up into a, a, a then because you get to go on TV if you're Brett Stevens, he went on MSNBC to explain why this is just like the Holocaust. And then he decided, you know what? I haven't been dragged enough. I'll use my goddamn New York Times column to clearly state that me being called a bed bug is exactly like Jews being persecuted mm -hmm. in World War II. And every step along the way, Brett Stevens did not understand why what he was doing was wrong. Because that's the rule. I, As a conservative, I get to ignore all the shit that my people are doing to destroy the world and focus on some stupid, trivial little thing that bugs me today and write about it. And if anybody criticizes me, I will destroy them. That is the deal. That's the devil's bargain that makes the career of David Brooks possible. He gets to write about campus speech codes or wearing a green jacket or both sides being wrong about everything every fucking week for the rest of his life and reap huge rewards for basically being an idiot because he has this wall around him of money, of, of the Schulzberger family, the people at NBC, the people at NPR, the people at PBS, all of whom link arms to make sure that no criticism ever gets through. And what happened to Brett yep. Stevens is criticism breached the wall. And he quit Twitter and he stormed off and God knows if he's ever coming back. But David Brooks looked at what happened to Brett Stevens and said, holy shit, there before the grace of God go I. If it can happen to one of us, it can happen to all of us. That's it. Somebody has to put these goddamn trolls on the internet who keep wanting to hold us accountable for mm -hmm. the shit we mm -hmm. say in their goddamn place. And I'm just the man to do it. <laughs> and he took his pen out and he wrote real hard, presumably with crayon on the backs of envelopes about what fanatic assholes, but buried in there, buried in the article is his real grievance, which is the people below me on the hierarchy think they can hold me accountable think they're better than me. think just because they're below me on the hierarchy, just because I get paid a shitload of money for doing a miserable job, that that's somehow unfair. And that's why the people below me are unhappy. And that they, they look at that as some sort of <laughs> injustice. And that I believe scared the daylights out of them because without this protective shield that the Beltway media gives to people, toxic people, liars like David Brooks, David Brooks would not have a job. He wouldn't be able to find a job anywhere. Brett Stevens would be a joke. He'd be a laptop. He wouldn't have a blog. He couldn't get a job at Breitbart. And that's what scares them, that there might come a day in the very near future when the peasants actually are within range of them to hold them accountable yeah. for the shit they say and do. Well, and that's, that's electing uh, a Democrat to the White House. Isn't it? That's electing a Democrat to the White House who, unlike Barack Obama, does not start his presidency by courting the good opinion of right. David Brooks. Right. And and going to George Will's house to have drinks with every conservative wing that in the world. Say, and let's be clear, this podcast loves Barack Obama. We love him. We do. We love Barack. He he made And we can admit that Barack Obama made a mistake. Donald he Trump did. in Alabama can't admit that, but we can no. admit Barack no. Obama made a mistake no. by having David Brooks to the White House and pretending that that makes him a bipartisan leader, right? Uh, and then, of course, Dave, we've been through that history where, you know, finally, right. one time Barack Obama stood up to the right. And why did David Brooks yeah. wrote a comment? Oh, I've been ruined. I'm, it's ruined. I'm I was, destroyed. I'm a sap. I'm a sap. I thought he was going to be a, a he leader, and he's not. He's the same old, same old. Yeah. I thought, I mean, that's when he called him a Chicago gangster and his gangster style politics. It's always right below the surface. If you are willing to sell out to win the approval of George Will and and uh, Ross Duthat and David Brooks and the rest of the clowns, uh, I think uh, uh, Charles Krauthammer was there. It was a whole gathering. of people, And you can charm those people. You can talk about, you know, both sides and purple states and Reinhold Niebuhr. And you can, it's easy to charm those people. But you, when your policies are being gutted by those people, when, when the nation is being sabotaged as a matter of, a matter of policy by those people's um, uh, idiot mm -hmm. army. And you keep going along and keep going on, keep believing in your heart of hearts that if I just compromise a little bit more, somehow they'll see the light. And all they see uh, when you do that is weakness and they demand more. Eventually, as Barack Obama did in his second term, he decided to punch back yeah. a little bit. And when the minute he did that, 
David Brooks and the rest of them lost their minds because it's all, because they don't live in the world. They live in a bubble in Washington, D.C., in New York. They do not know what the hell's going on in the rest of the country. The th- and I don't care. I really don't. They're shut-ins. What terrifies me is that their delusions, their fantasy about a completely imaginary Republican Party and a completely fictional crazy left are what completely dominates our discussion the media of narrative politics in and that government. bubble. Right. And, Right. And what we can do to yeah. fix problems. I mean, practically, how we how we treat one another in this country and how we treat uh, migrants and refugees and how we treat the weather mm-hmm. and how we treat the environment, et cetera. Mm-hmm. We can go on forever. How we treat our economic justice, uh, our reproductive justice, on and on. All of that depends on how we talk about it. And if we allow the David Brookses of this yeah. world to continue to live inside their bubble where they're protected and we're all supposed to be reasonable because both sides are equally bad. That stifles progress. Would you like to know how that manifested itself this week? Sure. In a news story that doesn't involve David Brooks at all. David Brooks is just a, an avatar for the entire failed system. Um, I would like you all to meet Doug Ogden. (laughs) There are a lot of Doug Ogdens out there, but we found one in particular this week or requested. Yeah. Do you mean the Doug Ogden? Yes, the Doug As Ogden. As I said to you is, earlier this week, who the hell is Doug Ogden? <laughs> yeah, well, patience. All will be revealed, Blue Gal. Uh, this is a story, a national story in the Associated Press with the headline, Democrats Face Identity Crisis in Next Phase of 2020 Race. Now, golly, you might think, that sounds pretty bad. That sounds important. Tell me more, Associated Press. The first sentence of the article is, Doug Ogden doesn't know what to do. Okay, so now you're thinking, that might really scare me if I knew who the fuck Doug Ogden was, but I don't. And then they go on to tell us that he's a 75-year-old retired law enforcement uh, enforcement officer who's disgusted by Donald Trump, but he can't imagine voting for a Democrat in 2020 either. He's a self-described, say it with me, Blue Gal. Independent. He's an Independent. In South Dakota, in South Carolina, rather, Ogden doesn't recognize the modern-day Democratic Party. The state of the Democratic Party is wild against Wilder, he said. It scares me. Now, is Doug Ogden an independent? Fuck no. <laughs> Doug, Doug Ogden is a lifelong Republican. Right. I, you, you know he you is. Know he is. You know he is. But what happened the last time Doug Ogden was disappointed with the GOP it was probably around 2007, with the Bush administration, you know, falling apart. And that's when he discovered his interior, his inner independence. And then he sat with that for a while and, and, and gutted, watched as his fellow independents uh, in their little tea party hats, uh, sabotaging the, the, the scary black guy who ran the country. And he was cool with that. And then Donald Trump came along and suddenly he found his, his republicanism again. But now it turns out the liberals were right about Donald Trump. So he has to go back to being a self-described independent. Now, the rest of the article claims to be a much broader discussion. Uh, The core of Ogden's concern is a broader question, no it's not, about the direction of the Democratic Party and its values in the age of Trump, which is bullshit, because Doug Ogden doesn't give a shit about the values of the Democratic Party or the shape of the party or where it's going. That has nothing to do with the lead of the story, because the end of the story says, back in South Carolina, Ogden isn't interested in hearing about multiracial coalitions. The Democrat Party, he said, has become the welfare party by offering too many free benefits to people not willing to work for them. The Republicans aren't any better, Ogden said. Republicans don't seem to want to change, and Democrats want to change everything. He added, I'll have to see if I can stomach either one of them. Both sides. Because you know why, Blue Gal? Because both sides are bad. Because both. This is the results of the toxic bullshit that people like David Brooks have been poisoning our well water with for decades. Because every time shit gets ugly, shit gets bad, people like Doug Ogden can suddenly discover that they're really independents and disappear into the woodwork. And and they get to go in front of a microphone, the Associated Press put in front of his mouth, and talk about how both sides disappointed. You know who disappoints me, Blue Gal? Doug Ogden disappoints me. He is a disappointment to him and all the Ogdens going back to five generations. But this is what happens. This is the this is these are the actual consequences of the narrative of our nation being broken from the very top. This is what happens when you let people on the right, the elite controllers of opinion, get away with murder because they think it doesn't ma- the people on the base, the people down on the, the grassroots believe, they have every reason to believe that anything they say 
they can get away with by saying after it all falls apart, well, I'm really independent. Both sides are bad. And they were taught that. They've been taught that by having it repeated, drilled into their skulls a million times by Chris Saliza and Matthew Dowd and Michael Gerson and Joe Scarborough and every other douchebag in the media. Uh, in contrast to Doug Ogden, we have David Weissman. And David Weissman is a screenwriter who used to be a Trump supporter. Tell me more. And he's not a never Trumper now. He is actually Democrat. He says he's a Democrat. He's supporting Elizabeth Warren for president. Oh, good. And uh, but he tweeted today. This mm -hmm. is Friday, and he tweeted today. And I I find this fascinating. Uh, this learning curve that he's gone through because this is sort of the the counterpoint to the Ogden guy, uh -huh. right? The Ogden guy really isn't changing his mindset of at course all. not he's he's learned what <laughs> camouflage to wear on which occasion right. he's wearing camo to cover up who he really is yeah david weissman appears to be at least saying look i was so wrong i was so completely wrong mm -hmm. i to i totally need to rewire my brain about politics mm -hmm. and so he's asking questions on twitter and here's his question for today Conservatives get so damn triggered at what Democrats want to do, but will get offended if you question their beliefs. Is it really okay to bash Dems, but God forbid we criticize Republicans? How have you guys put up with this double standard for so long? We haven't. We haven't. We just, Some of the, you know, it's been a rough 30 years, but... <laughs> we've been told to shut up and sit down for 30 goddamn years. Yeah. And we yeah, haven't shut up yeah. and don't sit down, but we're not welcome at the table because precisely for that reason. Yep. And he's, his second tweet, his, his reply to himself is, when you do explain your values on what you fight for, they act like you didn't even say anything. And then they ask, what are liberal values? Yeah. Yep. Yep. To, You're to, learning. You can be taught. <laughs> to every conservative who actually changes their mind, um, even a little bit, there comes a moment like this. Yeah. Uh, like, this happened, oh, my God. Yeah. You know, this happened to Kathleen Parker. It did. It Kathy did. Parker, yep. Yep. Who, who was enjoying the the benefits of being the, the one of the ladies of the conservative elite media. Yeah. And, and yep. oh, we love Kathleen Parker. She's so good. She's beautiful. Oh my God. She's and then she said something bad about Sarah Palin. That and was her, it. Her email in inbox filled up with death threats with the and C your word. bitch. Yes. You're a C with word. And, the C word. Yes. And, and that's not the surprising thing. The surprising thing was that she was surprised. Mm hmm. The surprise thing, oh, you'd never notice when all this was being heaped on people like us. Yeah. Because you didn't care. This is exactly what happened to Brett Stevens. You never mm -hmm. noticed the abuse that you're leveling at people for being beneath you and holding opinions that you differ with. You, you know, you want open campuses. You want these snowflakes on colleges to quit bitching about having to listen to other opinions until it comes for you. And then we see who you really are. So These do you mind are... if I read you two more David Weissman tweets? No, no, no. It sounds vastly entertaining. Yeah. It seems like every conversation I have asking conservatives what their principles are, regardless of if it's on Twitter or Facebook or even real life, it seems like it's the Democrat that has to defend the values. Have you noticed that? Yeah. And then he said, <laughs> this is the punchline drift class. Uh -huh. You're going to cry and laugh at the same time. Here's your punchline. Craft. I'll be crafting. Any one of my followers have connections with the New York Times or Washington Post? Please send me a DM. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. <laughs> Those aren't tears you're hearing, Blue Gal. And it's not laughter. I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. Grinding off your teeth. <laughs> I do know. Remember that there was a scene in Breaking Bad where, where uh, Walter finally loses it and just begins laughing hysterically and uncontrollably. Yeah. Yep. I'm, about, I'm right about there. You're right, right about now. there. I'm right, right about, about there. there. <laughs> All right, let's do a news roundup. All righty. Uh, do you want oh, let me Let me say, I love you, by the way. I love you, too. Yeah, it's oh, going to be okay. <laughs> it's it's going to be fine. Everything's going to be great. It's going to be... You know what? Here's yeah, the thing. We, have, we definitely have optimism bias here at yeah. the professional left. Well, we also crushed it at the trivia night the other night, so, you know. We did. We crushed it at trivia night, and we crushed it in the 2018 midterms, so we're we going to crush it again. Let's That's just right. do we're that again. We're going to do that. And uh, uh, truly... If if liberals programs, progressive programs, democratic programs are implemented, things will get better. Yeah. Not there won't be a there won't be an Eden, it won't be a paradise. There's a lot of shit to be cleaned up before we get back to a baseline of just a normal country where we can make yeah, normal Yeah, but decisions. I'll be goddamned if I'm gonna hear p complaints from people who supported Trump. No, no. 
no, no. That the, the, the Democratic president isn't doing it right. Yeah, the politeness days are over. Oh, okay? they're over forever. And the yep. people, the first time the tone police come out for oh us, my God. the minute president fill in the blank Democrat here is is nominated, that's when you and I and every other progressive has to do a Brett Stevens. We have to yeah. mount a peasant's revolt saying, <laughs> how fucking dare you? Yep. And tear them to pieces. And, and, and ma- make sure you take screenshots of those Trump supporting tweets from blue check marks. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah. well, I mean, for example, this week, uh, a, a small miracle did occur. Marianne Williamson talked extensively about praying hurricanes away, which, you know, isn't possible. But she did pray her own tweet away. Yeah, so, you know, she deleted her. She did a lot of things on Twitter that were very Brett Stevens, yeah. I have to say. She she wanted to pray the hurricane away. And then when it didn't pray away from the Bahamas, she deleted the tweet. Yes. I guess to pretend that she hadn't prayed it away. She, no, she was whatever. using her mind power. Her mind uh-huh. power. No, she, deleting yeah. a tweet doesn't use any mind power. You don't uh, And then she Angels also go, yeah. went after um, Erica Jong's daughter, uh, yeah. Molly Jong Fast, right. um, and sent a note to Molly Jong's mom, which was very Brett Stevens-ish. Right. Do you know what your daughter's <laughs> saying? Do you know who I am? Are you aware <laughs> what you've done? This is down to the Abbey and the Queen's coming and you're being very disrespectful. And Very she, sad. Yeah. Well, it, predictable. These are aristocrats. Like I, like I said, I have a couple of Marianne Williamson books. I'm not going to deny it. I've read yeah. read things that she said, and I there are parts of things that she says, and that Course in Miracles stuff that she does, where uh, if you focus your thought in certain ways, it is helpful to you intellectually yes. and emotionally, yes. and that's you. great. But. Uh, and and I do think that our politics needs to be more mindful, mm-hmm. uh, but not not deleting tweets wise. No. <laughs> and I I don't think she's qualified to be president. And we need to say that. Yeah. So very very unless she's nominated, in which case I will work my ass off. <laughs> I, absolutely, I will I will do that. You will I will delete this podcast. Blue. <laughs> Um, this will be gone. Podcast and become what? the Marianne well, Williamson Pray the yeah. Storm Away podcast. Yeah. Yes, okay. Pray the, we'll have to pray the deficit away because the minute oh, some Democrat man. touches that Bible, everybody's going to get real interested in balanced budgets. Deficit. And deficit together. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Republicans have decided to scrap four primaries. Now, that is not, I wrote about this today, that is not yep. unheard of. South no. Carolina, in particular, often cancels their primary uh, when an incumbent president is running the Republican Party in South Carolina. Uh, because the state party runs that primary and it's expensive. Right. Uh, but uh, this makes Trump look really weak when you have two announced primary challengers and all of a sudden four states, including Nevada and Arizona, mm-hmm. said, oh, I think we're just not going to have one. You know, we're going to save money that way. That'll work. Let's just not yeah. have a vote. Yeah. And uh, it was Bill Weld who said back in February on ABC's mm-hmm. this week, you know, there yes, are Republicans in Washington that just don't want to have an election. Right. <laughs> Let's just yes, not have are. any election. Let's just mm-hmm. keep Trump in power forever. And uh, that's called fascism and dictatorship. Mm-hmm. And we don't have that in this country. Tell me more about this fascism. Blue yeah, guy. really. <laughs> um, this was the week that Donald Trump canceled his state visit to Poland so he could stay home and tweet about Alabama and Deborah Messing. And go Very on important. two and, rounds and of golf. golf. Yeah, and golf, of course, 36 holes really, of golf, yeah. yeah. He's going to golf the hurricane away, Blue Guy. He can do it. Because he has mind power, baby, mind power. <laughs> Howard Schultz reappeared long enough to drop out of the presidential race. So how long until Steve Schmidt gets his MSNBC gig back? I don't know. He's, I don't know. He may have just a bet on that one. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, it's it's between him and Mark Halperin. You know, who gets to back in the back in the saddle first? I don't know. Um Donald Trump called a Fox News correspondent to the Oval Office to insist that he wasn't wrong when he claimed Hurricane Dorian could have hit Alabama. A White House official later said that Trump was the one who drew on a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration map with a Sharpie. As I mentioned before, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has changed hurricane designations to great and not great. To category, never heard of it before. Yes, yes. By the way, we we have not gone, you know, uh, in great detail, if much of any detail about Hurricane Dorian, because we're we're recording this on a Friday and it's everywhere. You don't really need us to tell you what's going on, who to contact, what you can do as a yeah, decent human being and a help. good citizen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just it's just terrifying. That's what that's what dangerous weather looks like. Um, and there is n- literally nothing we can do to prevent that from happening again in the near future. 
but there are things we can do to, for our fellow human beings to help ease their suffering. That's right. That's right. The Pentagon will plunder money from military construction projects in 23 states, three territories, and 19 countries to pay for Trump's border wall. Mm -hmm. In addition, $3.6 billion with a B will be taken from 127 projects to fund 11 border barrier projects in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And Mexico is going to pay for the wall. If you'd like to, and, and you can you can argue, and I would agree with you that the Pentagon budget is bloated and, and overspent, but that's a different discussion. This is taking money away from the, the, the institution that Republicans always turn to as saying, we're the patriots, we love America, we take care of our vets, taking money away from them to fulfill the president's promise to build a wall that nobody wants, that nobody needs, that will do nothing. The last, as we call it on the podcast, the last Confederate monument. Um, and I'm fascinated to find out how he's going to conduct rallies from now on without being able to add the tagline, and Mexico will pay for it. Mexico will pay for it. And also, I'm wondering where he's going to be able to have a rally where this diversion of funds doesn't affect jobs. Because yeah. a lot of these projects are brick and mortar building jobs to pr to build secure, you know, seawalls and so forth. Whatever whatever it is, they're building projects. They're they are ha hammer and cement jobs, yeah. and that means these jobs are lost if this funding doesn't go through. So yep. I'm looking forward to hearing from Republican congressmen who are losing jobs in their districts because Trump wants to build this wall. Uh, and he promised Mexico would pay for it. Bye-bye, Martha McSally. Yeah. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. no, not to mention the uh, land grab that this is going to entail at the border, yeah. which private property is something that Republicans used to like. Mm -hmm. Trump's Middle East peace negotiator is quitting, and did you know who's replacing him? The, the Middle East Jared, peace Jared. guy is going to be the guy who used to bring Jared coffee. I'm not making that up. No. Well, yeah, this, this is, I swear to God, I swear to God, if you didn't live through the Iraqi um, yep. uh, invasion yep. and the yep. uh, number of nitwits and incompetence yep. and douchebags yep. and politically connected teenagers who were given really important jobs yep. uh, overseeing the the resurrection of Iraqi civil society and failing catastrophically during the Bush administration, this is what that was like, except this is like 10 times worse. Um, because uh, in this case, all of this is optional. Yeah. I mean, there were things that needed to be done in Iraq, and the Bush administration always did them badly. This was a, That was a sandbox for them to try everything they wanted to do. The number one, I think the second law they passed in Iraq, the second, the coalition provisional authority, the first or second rule they passed was a flat tax. Wow. Because they wanted to try their Randite, their, their crackpot Randite theories out on a, a country that they'd already ruined and it wouldn't affect them in any way. So this is absolutely, and this is why it's really important to bury the Bush administration, to, to memory hole everything Bush did, memory hole the entire Obama administration. So no one says, wait a minute, isn't this what Republicans always do when they're in power? Yeah. And the answer is yes, this is always what they do. Um the Trump administration is getting rid of requirements for energy efficient light bulbs that Congress passed in 2007 because, I guess, Obama, even though Obama wasn't president in 2007. And most corporations and government offices have switched these light bulbs because they're cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just freedom, blue gal. Yeah. You know, freedom isn't free, blue gal. It's not free. It costs things to pay for stuff. Again, Mitch McConnell reiterated that he is powerless to bring any legislation to the floor of the Senate without the expressed approval of dear leader. Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump strongly suggested and then denied that Mike Pence should go and stay at his stupid Irish golf club and hotel during a tax funded trip to Ireland, despite the fact that it was on the other side of the fucking country and took uh, more than 150 miles of transit time to go one way, including all of his details and all of his people. Yeah, and he flew uh, because he flew that. So that yeah. was, you know, real, real environmentally responsible. And uh, I don't know if it's in our notes later, but Pence had a really uh, bad visit to Ireland. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he did uh, in, in every way. Yeah. He yeah. just he had a whole bad visit everywhere. He he had to shake hands with with a gay, 
Uh, he, he had to deal with people who didn't think the president was a good a good man and thought he was kind he of He had idiot. to deal with people who don't want Brexit. And he went and praised Boris Johnson in front of everybody and, right. and Brexit and all of that. And, and uh, as one newspaper said, really shit the bed, shit the carpet. And, and when asked about what about um, um, this whole going to Donald Trump's little retreat, as opposed to staying, you know, within 150 miles of the actual conference you're supposed to be. He he got that dead doll-eyed stare yeah. on his face for about a minute. He said, I was great visiting Ireland. It was wonderful. And it's like, oh, this is the number two guy. If Donald Trump is hit by a meteor, this meathead is the guy who's going to take over. No, you have to impeach all of them. They all have to go. There's no backup in the Republican Party that's any less despicable than the ones at the top. It's rotten all the way down. Joe Balish, the former top Trump official at the Interior Department who oversaw oil and gas drilling on federal lands, has joined an oil and gas company less than a week after resigning from the Interior Department. Drain the swamp. The, drain the, swamp. Uh, the company that Trump's campaign manager owns received almost a million dollars in business from a pro-Trump super PAC. That's Brad Parscale, who created Red State Data. I am digital to act as a firewall company that allowed to continue working with the American first super PAC during the midterm elections without violating the rules that say you can't coordinate between the candidate and the super PAC. Uh, it was founded on March 2nd, 2018, a couple of days after it was announced that Pascal would become Donald Trump's 2020 campaign manager. There's always money in the banana. There shack. It's always Europe. money in the banana shack. And the idea that he could just create a company that he doesn't mm -hmm. control. His wife controls that. So it's separate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. This is this all this campaign bullshit has got to go. Yeah. A group of Trump's allies is trying to raise at least $2 million to investigate reporters and editors that Trump doesn't like. In a mm -hmm. fundraising pitch, the group claims it will provide damaging information about reporters and editors to friendly media outlets such as mm -hmm. Breitbart as well as traditional media when possible. <laughs> yeah. I look forward to a whole Oxford comma, you know, yeah. dust up. I, and this is, you know, this, this, they're following the fascist playbooks. Right. Down. Page by page. Yep. Loot the place, put, put corrupt assholes in power, um, get rid of the judges, put only fascist judges in place and attack the media and attack any last vestige of free, free media, uh, free and open media in the country. Uh, Donald Trump tweeted a detailed aerial satellite photograph of an Iranian of an Iranian launch pad that appears to have come from classified intelligence briefings uh, because he just can't help waving his dick around in public. Mm -hmm. And again, this, and this happened. We, we say this every week. There's always 20 of these things. But this one specifically, if if uh, President Hillary Clinton or President Barack Obama had done done this, they would be gone by, by sundown. Yep. They'd be impeached by sundown. A federal judge blocked the White House's decision to revoke a Playboy reporter's press pass after, you know, uh, Seb Gorka had a fight with him. I fought him. I fought him. Talk about for the Seb honor. Gorka's podcast this week. Uh, oh, Janine Pirro um, was on <laughs> Seb Gorka's podcast bitching about how uh, Fox News tells her what to do. <laughs> right. And I asked you, I think I asked it's called you this week, is she always drunk? Yeah, the, well, the Seb. To be fair, the Gorka podcast is called Day Drinking with Seb Gorka, <laughs> so it's, she has to. It's the law. You have to get drunk to go on that show. And really, if I were to go on that show, I would be loaded. Yeah. Um. Yeah. She she sat there going, "They tell me I can't do nothing, man. I can't do nothing. I can't go on Bill O'Reilly. Right. I can't do the, the Ingram thing. Can't do Newsmax. I can't do Newsmax. I can't go on the mm -hmm. podcast with with Bill O'Reilly and talk about wealth building." Mm -hmm. Uh, and she also said that, yes, I was suspended and I'm afraid I'm going to be fired and I hope I'm not mm -hmm. fired and I'm probably not going to be fired. You know, <laughs> I can't yeah. imagine that that was that interview wasn't six or seven violations of her contract. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I was waiting for the moment where she starts getting weepy, mm -hmm. you know, like dive into the gray, grave weepy going, if Roger Ailes are alive, none of this yeah. shit, you people, we show you. And then she passes yeah. out because yeah. that's the yeah. exciting part when yeah. you just get so, so drunk yeah. that you, you pass out mid sentence. But that is a 
um, respected Fox News contributor with her yeah. own show. Yeah. She has her own show Saturday yep. nights, and Donald Trump loves mm-hmm. her, so there you go. Mm-hmm. Um, coal mining shutdowns in Wyoming are causing reality to come crashing through the door. Apparently, uh, they're shutting down coal mines in Wyoming. It's uh, freaking out the people who have been working there all this time because the one thing that they were promised is that they wouldn't be uh, idled or they wouldn't lose their job, and now mm-hmm. they are. Very much like... Um, I don't know, corn and soybean right. farmers in our area around here, all of whom went to the polls, the steel mill people, coal people, farmers, all went to the polls, all listened to Fox News, were all listening to Sean Hannity, were all listening to Rush Limbaugh, telling them that this guy gets it, man. This is the guy. And they all went in and they rolled past a bunch of liberals saying, are you out of your mind? Do you know how fucked you're going to be once this guy's in office? And they cast their ballots and now they're all realizing, oh, okay, I guess we're all going to have to change our name to Doug Ogden because we're all going to have to become independents tomorrow because we certainly can't admit that we're too stupid to know where our interests lie and that we keep getting chumped by the same assholes over and over again. But eventually, once they reach into your wallet, once they f- get you fired from your job, once your industry shuts down, you there's no more room to pretend that everything is okay and that you made a sound right. decision for the good of the and country. And we, you noticed something really mm-hmm. interesting about uh, Sinclair News this week. Uh, I did. They did a story about a vegan woman who sued her neighbors over barbecuing meat outdoors. And Sinclair covered this mm-hmm. in great detail. Uh, yes, they did. And this is our local Channel 20, who has, by the way, has an opening for the, the uh, news director. For months, and I, they've had an opening I, for yeah, news for like eight nine months. Right, I really want that job for, for one day. Just <laughs> one day, just give me that job yeah. for one day. I will, I will go out a legend. I swear to you. <laughs> but yeah, this this woman was uh, sued her neighbors because the barbecuing meat. Uh, so she sued them. I'm like, wow, that sounds pretty bad. That's, that sounds amazing. And then they say the case went all the way to Australia's Supreme Court. It's like what? Australia. You're covering what? an Australian yeah. vegan lawsuit story. <laughs> right. Why are you doing that? Why? And then there's a story about a scary looking black guy who tried to freeze a kitten. <laughs> and then sorry. a lady came up. Freezing yeah. kitten is not funny, but no, the not. fact that Sinclair decided our local Sinclair station, which mm-hmm. surely this, these stories are syndicated and demand yeah. comes from the top of the Sinclair. Well, I'm sure there's world. a list here. Pick, right. pick one of these. Uh, but then the scary black guy in the, in the sleeveless t-shirt uh, <laughs> who tried to freeze the kitten Shot the lady with a BB gun who tried to save the kitten. Oh, wow. So you got two, there's a twofer right there. Scary black guy with a gun, uh, T-shirt, scary it's looking like picture. World News Daily the, on is. your TV, on your uh, local news. I have noticed several babies left in cars. <laughs> Usually by like a gang, they, yeah, they go to a yeah. store and they leave the baby in the car. All of which take place in like other countries or in California or in Wyoming, that nowhere near, not within a thousand miles of Springfield, Illinois, which is where they're broadcasting from. So you got to wonder, once maybe coincidence, twice? No, no, no. This is a habit with them. This, this is, is a pattern. Their, this is their programming model. Yeah. And well, I love and what I, you wrote in our notes. Could you want to read that in your best Sinclair announcer voice? Sure. Well, when I get the news director job, it'll be... <laughs> Sinclair, where you get the weather on the fives, sports on the sevens, and riling up the local conservative shut-ins on the nines. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And that's what they do. They pump these, they pull these stories out of literally halfway around the world just to make the local wing nuts mad. Oh, did you see what that vegan thing? Hear about that? Oh my God, liberals. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so mad. I'm going to write a letter to, my, letter to the editor. And of course their letter to the editor will be published because... The same sorts of idiots who run the local newspaper are the same sorts of idiots who run the local yeah. radio or TV station. Unbelievable. So, and we live here. This is why we can speak with some authority about how these people think and do and live and how they act and how they're likely to react in much more accurate terms than the people who live in the D.C. New York bubble who have never actually met a Republican in their entire life, apparently. Which is why we have this annoying habit of being right most of the time and they have this habit of being catastrophically wrong most of the but time. But when we, we started off our show talking about conservatives being brainwashed, this is how it's done. Yeah, this is it. This is how it, every it, day. Every human, day. And quote unquote human interest clickbait stories. 
you know, mm-hmm. baby left in a car. Oh my God. You know, that's going oh, to God. elicit a visceral reaction from any sane human being would be very upset if they knew mm-hmm. that on their local street, a baby had been left in a car, right? Mm-hmm. But it doesn't matter that it's in Wyoming or California or Australia no. or anywhere else in the world. They're programming you to have a visceral reaction and then they're going to hit you with Boris Epstein's editorial about Donald Trump being the greatest yeah. president ever. Yeah. And you're sunk. You're in. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Libby. And Libby is shown with her best friend, Frankie, who is a Timna African parrot. And it's hard to see Frankie in this picture. Frankie has this big, huge cage as parrots are wont to have. Uh, but Libby's sitting right outside that cage and, and making friends, you know, <laughs> like like cats do. Uh, and you better believe that Libby doesn't dare eat Frankie. Frankie is huge. <laughs> and Frankie <laughs> would uh, do some damage. Uh, Libby eats freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you buy pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the only cat food they eat is freshly poured cat food. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. You can visit Libby and Frankie at our Facebook page or website, and you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job and a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Driftglass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, this week is a national security bulletin, Blue Gal, so it's kind of serious. Okay. Uh, the Internet Kitties have used their executive powers to redirect funds from our mortgage and car payments to buy several hundred much-needed cat toys. <laughs> Because they have that power, right? <laughs> you know, I don't want to remind them that they said Mexico would pay for the cat toys. Mexico would pay I think for the some, cat toys. They just, they, they, that was what they promised. But, you know, who am I? I, I don't have supreme executive power. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018.